I am Cecile Touchon, and today I am the face of America. My name is Cecil Touchon, and I'm a visual artist living in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, I mostly work with uh, typographic abstraction, I call it, which uh, I've been working on that style for uh, over 20 years at this point. I was born in Austin, Texas, 1956, while my parents were uh, going to University of Texas at Austin uh, at that time. Uh, the family in general is from Fort Worth, Texas. Both my mom and my dad are originally from Fort Worth, Texas. I have a, <clears throat> an old photograph of me with cowboy boots on and about nine years old sitting on my grandmother's couch with a box of fine art colored pencils and a sketchbook. And, uh, you know, so I mean, every summer when I would visit my grandparents and, and basically stay there for the summer with them. Uh, that was kind of uh, other than going out and plodding around the, uh, the farm next door, which was my uncle's farm, uh, and their property, which was, I don't know, six or seven acres, and we were right next to the river. And uh, so I got to plug around a lot and dig around looking for fossils and things like that. But when I wasn't doing those things, I was usually just drawing something. Uh, so drawing just slowly became, you know, a key form of personal self-expression and entertainment. And uh, so, you know, I kind of say that I'm a natural born artist. I didn't really have any other intention to do some other thing for a, you know, for a living or a future. Uh, you mentioned the idea of standing on a precipice and uh, uh, feeling like you're at the very edge of what can still be regarded as a linguistic experience. And I, I've actually had other poets tell me the same thing, that, uh, that they feel a, a certain sense of internal terror uh, at the idea of looking at my works and realizing that they're about poetry and about language, but that there's nothing there for them to grasp in the same way that they think of language. So, uh, and, and that's a big part of my exploration. I mean, the, the early, you know, examples would be like Zom poetry, you know, like from Russia or, you know, the futurist poetry uh, that Marinetti and those guys made as a way of attempting to liberate language uh, from its uh, severe structure that we all understand. Uh, and, uh, but I felt like nobody had ever really addressed language in the same way that painters addressed the image painting. Because uh, until Cubism, let's say, uh, everybody read a painting just like they read a book. I mean, it was all about the image that was in the painting and you looked past the paint, past the techniques, to the actual image. And that's what everybody believed was the way to make a painting was to not actually see the painting, just like we don't actually see the words when we're reading in a book. We just see the ideas that the words in their patterns generate in our heads. So I, I felt like... I wanted to unravel the language to the point that it achieved the same level of non-objectivity that painters were achieving in painting a hundred years ago, uh, because I felt like it was the last vestige of representationalism, you know, in the arts is uh, is 
is poetry and the use of language for that purpose. So, you know, I mean, a lot of poets early on, they experimented with, uh, you know, nonsense or, but they always had in their head that it was verbal, that it made sound, uh, that it stacked up to rhythms and structures. And I decided, what if you took the letters instead of not thinking of them as sounds, but thinking of them as visual objects that could be dissected and reconstructed and pushed around in such a way that, uh, that the letters themselves could no longer be heard, that they were just reduced to a state of silence, that you just could only look at them, but you couldn't hear them. So, so that, but at the same time, I wanted to stick with the idea of abstract images that you still know are language, that they're language based. And as long as we're in that arena between the visual and the uh, literary, then that's the area where I'm exploring the, uh, like you say, the limits, the, the abyss between those two things, between image and, and language. These works started out as collage because originally uh, one of my first inspirations for the current body of work was when my wife and I, Rosalia, moved down to her home state of Cuernavaca, Mexico. And we drove all day from, you know, the border to central Mexico. And so at about three in the morning, we arrived in Mexico City. So we're coming out of the desert, out of, you know, the dark. And then we come into this amazing, humongous city. And, and, and we're like the only ones in it because it's three in the morning. There's just the you know, the street crews out there cleaning up or whatever, and a few cars, maybe some delivery guys, and that's it. And normally you can't, I mean, Mexico City, the whole uh, highway system is essentially a heart in continuous arrest. You know, I mean, it's, it's constantly clogged. Uh, it takes hours and hours to go five miles in Mexico City on the highway system. No matter how many they build, it's such a, a massive city that, uh, you know, I, we were lucky. And, and ever after that, anytime we had to go through Mexico City to go to the United States, we went at off hours when we knew there wasn't going to be unending traffic. So anyway, as we rode into Mexico City, there's all these amazingly huge billboards that are uh, you know advertising but instead of painting over the signs when some advertiser quit paying for his uh, you know his monthly lease on the on the sign they would just send the sign guys out to shuffle the boards around so that you could no longer see the message the advertising message but all of the information of the message is still on there, all the letters, all the whatever, but they've all been put at all different uh, locations where it just became very abstracted signs that didn't really have a message on them anymore. But they're still visual and very interesting looking. And then you couple that with the fact that I didn't really understand Spanish anyway, uh, and that like doubled the impact of the visual nature of the signs. So hence, these were massive collage units. Uh, and I was already working in collage. So I thought I'm going to work like that. I think there's something really interesting there. So I made collages for probably starting in 1998 or 99 with that idea. And eventually, I, I started to make paintings based on the collages. So I converted the collages in my head into uh, studies that I would make these studies and then I would just blow them up to whatever scale I wanted them to be at and make them into paintings. 
And then the paintings are all made in such a way that you can read the collage construction in the painting by how I shade the parts where you can see where each, you know, square of paper that's glued next to the other one, you, you can see all of that information in the paintings. So you understand how the image ended up like it is as a bunch of disparate parts that are put together to add up to the composition. I would say that these typographic works are ultimately a form of political statement uh, because, well, number one, a visual object is a political object. It is a set of various things that are put together either that have a a king as the center of it that's larger than all the other parts that are all secondary or it's a more of a democracy where all the parts are you know of equal weight and value in the painting or it can be a lot of other different uh, you could say even political systems that you could use for how you organize the elements in a painting but at the same time since my interest is in language. I look at language and I see that language has been used from the beginning as a visual, a visual form of language. I mean, there was who knows how long people uh, were communicating with each other directly, you know, word of mouth. But when somebody came up with the idea that they could create these signs and symbols and shapes and forms, and teach people how to comprehend a meaning from them, then, then all of a sudden you came into this very powerful, powerful position of number one, being able to communicate with the people that you've taught how to read this language that no one else can read is just invisible to them. This has massive military potential back at the time of the, let's say, the Romans or the Greeks or uh, the Chinese or the Japanese to be able to use linguistic signs to organize and uh, orchestrate uh, events in a way that, uh, that the enemy or whoever, the general population, was unable to comprehend the patterns that were being communicated. So when you think about language as a, a secret uh, military hardware, uh, then at the beginning, that's how political systems were built up and how laws became something to control the population with where they would put, you know, Stella's out at the far distance of their territory uh, and uh, and put all of these words and signs on them, and then that extended their power and their law out to that point where everybody had to conform to whatever was written on those uh, stone tablets. And you know, th this is an amazing thing. I mean, it's 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 very human and then artists themselves over the years they're the ones who understood how to carve these things and make them for the governmental military forces and so that gave them the opportunity to start messing around and creating artistic objects using language such as poetry or whatever and and have their own expression and and develop the expression of language into something that could be considered beautiful or impactful to other people. And that's kind of where language started. But at the same time, it, it has tremendous power over the human mind and you know the idea of language. I mean, I don't know how many people, I was thinking about it this morning, how many people uh, ever have quiet inside of their mind that's not overrun by linguistic communication in their own head to themselves or whatever. And I don't think anybody even thinks about the idea of being silent, internally silent and quiet and, you know, and not having language as a continuous, uh, you know, landscape in their own mind.